tell you a little bit about the Public Affairs Forum. <clears throat> Several years ago, four or five years ago, we began to think about how to bring um, individuals to our campus who had past political experience and could be a resource for uh, those um, current students who perhaps weren't even born when the individuals uh, held their public office. We have brought former political leaders <clears throat> that include uh, former Governor David Hall, former Governor George Nye, former Governor uh, Frank Keating. Congressman Mickey Edwards' remarks today will be remarkable. I know that because of the dinner we had last night. They will be remarkable for their insight and come from his deep well of personal political experience and his keen knowledge of the American political journey. The format today will be remarks by Congressman Edwards, followed by a conversation with him. The program will last approximately an hour. At the conclusion of the program, everybody is enjoy, uh, invited to stay for uh, refreshments who are over here to my left. And uh, Congressman Edwards will be here and he will be available to visit with you individually. I know that you will be informed um, and um, you will enjoy the comments uh, that Congressman Edwards will make today. I, I see someone else in the audience that I want to give special recognition to. Suzanne Broadbent, would you, would you please stand as well? Thank you. Mickey Edwards is a former Republican congressman who served Oklahoma's 5th Congressional District for 16 years. During his time in Congress, he served on the House Budget and Appropriations Committees and as chairman of the House Republican Policy Committee. After leaving Congress, Mr. Edwards taught for 11 years at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government before moving on first to Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs and then back to Washington, D.C. as vice president of the Aspen Institute where he directs a bipartisan fellowship for elected public officials. Mr. Edwards grew up in South Oklahoma City, has degrees in both law and journalism, and he began his career as a newspaper editor and reporter and later won awards in advertising and public relations before being elected to Congress. While teaching at Harvard, he returned to journalism as a weekly political columnist for the Chicago Tribune and the Los Angeles Times and broadcast a weekly commentary on national public radios, all things considered. He is a board member of both the Project on Government Oversight and the Constitution Project, where he chaired uh, task forces on judicial independence and the war power. He was a member of the American Bar Association Select Task Force on the use of presidential signing statements and the American Society of International Laws Task Force on the International Criminal Court. He has also chaired policy task forces for both the Brookings Institution and the Council on Foreign Relations. Mr. Edwards has also been an elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Among his books, are Reclaiming Conservatism, which I highly recommend, published in 2008 by Oxford University Press, and The Parties Versus the People, How to Turn Republicans and Democrats into Americans, published in 2013 by Yale University Press. His articles have appeared frequently in publications ra ranging from the New York Times to the Washington Post, the public interest, and the Atlantic. He is a frequent public speaker and has been a guest on many of the nation's leading radio and television news and opinion broadcasts. Please join me in welcoming the former congressman from Oklahoma's 5th Congressional District, the Honorable Mickey Edwards. It, it is so good to be back home again. I, I have to tell you that uh, when I was in the House, 
we, we usually had uh, our meetings where, where I've come back regularly on weekends. Uh, and, and because I was the first Republican elected since 1928 uh, from this district, I was back here all the time uh, and would have my meetings here at, at the community college and uh, spent a lot of time. I grew up here on the South Sider, uh, where South Sider uh, grew up on Southwest uh, 27th, just off Western, uh, went to Capitol Hill High School. And, and so, you know, be, being on the South Side, th this is the only part I knew. When later I, I lived north, and it was really strange to see what downtown looked like from the other side. It was, uh, you know, I, I was, th this, this was my home. Uh, I, I owe so much, I owe so much, uh, Jerry, very, very kind about the things I have done since. Uh, but I owe so much to the people here. Uh, I, I was the first Republican elected uh, in my district since 1928. I had never held any office before. Uh, and the, the people of this community put their trust in me. You know, they, they were good enough to set me on a career that has been you know, very rewarding, giving me a chance to uh, have some impact, I hope, but also uh, a chance to really understand more about America, to understand more about the, the wholeness of America. So we, we have some problems, and, and I'm, I'm going to talk about them, uh, but I want to talk about also uh, the underlying issue about what the new generation is going to have to deal with. Um, the great seal of the United States has a motto adopted by the founders, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. And it had two meanings. One of them was that out of 13 separate colonies, we were going to become one America, one nation. And the other was out of a society of very different people, people of different backgrounds, different experiences, and today even more diverse, 320 million of us, very, very diverse, different races, different religions, different life experiences, but that we're one America. That's who we are. And we are losing that. America is fraying. America is becoming separate nations at war with each other over politics. And I, I'll get into some of the uh, more detail of that. But you know, in a war, you know, whether it was World War II or Vietnam or uh, Korea or the, the current wars, when you're, when you're in the foxhole or when you're on the hill and people are shooting at you, it's a group of people, it's a group of Americans. Some are black, some are Hispanic, some are white, some are Asian, some are, you know, from, some are Jewish and some are Baptist and some are Catholic and, uh, and they're all there together and when we go to the Olympics and we cheer USA, 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 we're, we're looking at a group of Americans carrying our flag who are different races, different religions, come from different places, who are Mexican Americans, who are Chinese Americans, who are every kind of mix. We cannot be an America that is divided that is at war with each other. We're all Americans and we have got to recapture our common Americanness. So all of us have multiple parts of us, right? We have multiple uh, identities. So you may think of yourself as a a Jewish American or a Catholic American or an Irish American and we'll do St. Patrick's Day or whatever. You know, all of these things. But that is a sublimated part of our bigger identity as Americans. And when we start making that smaller part the dominant one, and, and we take our differences and make them dividing warriors, make, make us armies against each other, then America's days are behind her. We can't do that, and it is up to your generation 
to recapture this. So one of the things that, uh, and I won't get into it here as I'm actually writing a new book about it, but the, uh, the founders had a lot of disagreements about, you know, the founders didn't really like each other that much, you know, to be honest about it. Uh, but they agreed on one thing. Washington and Adams and Jefferson and Madison and you know, all the founders agreed on one thing. George Washington gave a large part of his final farewell address to one topic. Do not create political parties. Do not create them. Our founders all agreed on that. They wrote a constitution that did not provide for political parties because they knew they would tear us apart. And, and we have reached a point where there, there's a study, there have been several studies recently. In, in the 1960s, if you said, uh, if you asked people and their polls were done, how would you feel if a member of your family married a member of the other political party? At that point, it was 4% of Democrats thought it would be terrible. 5% of Republicans thought it would be terrible. Today, it's over 30% of Democrats think it would be horrible if a member of your family married a Republican, and 40% of Republicans think it would be terrible if you had somebody in your family marry a Democrat. We have got to get over this. We don't need the Russians to try to tear us apart. We're doing it to ourselves. There was a, a few years ago, a man named Bill Bishop, I hate to say anything good about him because he's a Texan, but uh, <laughs> Bill Bishop uh, wrote a book called The Big Sort. And in The Big Sort, what he talked about now, I, I'm going to assume that everybody in this room is different. Everybody is different from this. But the other people who are not here hang out with people who think like they do. They only watch Fox or they only watch MSNBC and they hate the people who watch the other one. That they, they found uh, in his book that you could live in a society where virtually all of you chose to live in a society where people who thought what you did and you didn't want to hear another point of view. That's why on so many colleges now, so many colleges won't let a Republican speak and other colleges won't let a Democrat speak because you already know what you think. I read it somewhere. This is my belief. Don't tell me different. Uh, my, my great heroes are Galileo, Copernicus, uh, and Charles Darwin. And there, there were my heroes, not necessarily, you know, because specifically what they said, but because they stood up and said, we're not going to do things that way anymore. Remember, Copernicus said, he was obviously crazy, uh, he, he said that the... Uh, the, the earth revolves around the sun. The sun doesn't revolve around the earth. Well, everybody, everybody then knew, you know, that the uh, sun revolved around the earth, and he was nuts. Uh, and uh, then the, when, when Galileo uh, said the same thing, you know, they locked him up. You know, they put him under house arrest because he dared to say something which was, in fact, true, but everybody knew it wasn't. Um, so I am hoping that we are going to arrive at a point where all of us shed one thing, shed one thing, certitude, belief that what you know is the truth and nobody else has an idea. You know, that, we, that you're so full of the ideas that we have already locked in, locked into place and shut out the possibility of hearing other things. So that's one of, one of the things I, you know, have very much on my mind that uh, e pluribus unum is becoming, you know, passe. 
and uh, we, we won't survive that way. But so let, let me talk about uh, some more specifics. Um, and I, I don't mean this to be um, totally a downer. I, I have to tell you, I, I am married to a Democrat. And um, we, we don't agree on very much, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I learned something. Uh, she's a professor. And uh, so she and I were both giving a, uh, speeches at a conference in Boulder, Colorado. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Boulder, but I mean, they are left. That's a liberal place. Uh, and here I am, I'm the Republican up there. And uh, so my wife came to my defense, and, and she looked out at this audience. It wasn't planned. I didn't know she was going to do it. She didn't know she was going to do it. But she saw all these really hostile liberals you know, out there looking at me. She said, if I can sleep with a Republican, you can at least talk to one. <laughs> so, um, so, I mean, really, that's kind of what, what I'm hoping uh, that you all will do. Um, I think we have to start. Uh, one place we have to start is with our political system. Um, our political system is uh, destructive of two things. It's destructive of democracy, and it's destructive of our republic. You know, we're, we're a very unique nation. We are both a... So one of the things that, that's fun, I always... When I, whenever I would talk to liberals... They would always say, we're not a democracy. I mean, they, they, no, they would say, we are a democracy. We're not a republic. And Republicans would say, no, we're a republic. We're not a democracy. I mean, there's never been a dumber conversation in my life because we're both. We, we, we are uh, a democracy in that we elect, we choose among ourselves the people who will go to Washington or to Oklahoma City and make the decisions for us. But we are a republic in that we have a, created a system where even the masses are controlled by constitutional constraints, and there are some things that the masses, in a great totality, cannot force you know, individuals to do. You can't take away uh, their rights, uh, even if they're in the minority. Uh, and uh, when, you, when you start looking at what we really did here, uh, what, what did the Constitution do by setting up this system? It changed us. It changed us from subjects, we'd always been somebody's subject, some king's subject, some dictator's subject, and turned us into citizens. And when it made us citizens and put us in charge, that meant that the burden, this is the hard part about it, the burden's on us. It, nobody else is going to do it. We choose. We make the decisions. And here is the way our political system has worked to do great damage. I am not trying here to suggest to you that you throw off political parties and outlaw them, although 40% of uh, Americans today uh, have decided to be independent. 40% of Americans have rejected both political parties. So everybody here probably thinks about liberal democratic Massachusetts. I have a house in liberal democratic Massachusetts. There are more independents in Massachusetts than there are Democrats more independents than, than there are Republicans. And if you talk to millennials, and a lot of you are millennials, uh, millennials will tell me, we're the a la carte generation. Don't give us, you gotta choose between, you know, list A and list B. We'll take what we want from this one and from that one. So we have a system, th this has been a very embarrassing thing for me. Uh, there's nobody here probably old enough to remember when I was elected, uh, but, uh, I, I, I ran against, I had never run, and I run against a guy named G.T. Blankenship who had been the Attorney General in the state. Uh, great, wonderful, wonderful guy. Uh, and I beat him in a primary. And if, if the laws were different so that after the primary he could have still run even though he hadn't received the endorsement of the party activists who vote in primaries. If he could have still run, he would have clobbered me and he'd be standing up here and, you know, I wouldn't. Uh, and it would have all changed. Uh, but that's what should have happened. What should have happened. So let me give you an example of what our political system has become. Um, 
And, and I'm going to mention some names. And I don't care whether you love these guys or, or hate them, because uh, that's beside the point. I, I looked at how Ted Cruz got to be a United States Senator, because Ted had run against a man named David Dewhurst, who uh, was lieutenant governor of uh, Texas, had carried the state three times, overwhelmingly, very, very popular. Uh, and they ran in a primary. And Dewhurst beat Cruz by 12 points. I mean, he trashed him. But there were more people in the race, so, so Dewhurst didn't get over 50%. And the result of it was they had a runoff, and, and Cruz won the runoff. Dewhurst could not run in the general election because Texas has a, I, look, I think it's a stupid law, but it's Texas. Um, the, uh, they have a law in Texas that if you ran for your party's nomination and you didn't get it, you're not allowed to run in the general election, even if you would have been the most popular person in the state. And so Dewhurst couldn't run. Uh, it was a Republican state, so Cruz was the only Republican allowed to be on the ballot, and he won. Uh, so I looked at, you know, how many people in Texas made him the only Republican allowed to be on the ballot? 2% of the population. And so I looked at another state in Utah where Robert Bennett, a conservative Republican, was running for uh, re-election, and they had a convention. Uh, and he, again, the party activists didn't like him. He was very conservative, but he actually had friends who were Democrats. He talked to Democrats. I mean, this is something you're not allowed to do. Uh, and so they did not renominate him, and he was not allowed to run again because they have the same law. Uh, he could not run again where he would have been easily reelected. Now, we're talking about the person who decides on voting whether you go to war whether treaties are approved, who sits on the Supreme Court, who can be in the president's cabinet. It's no game about who gets to uh, you know, be uh, elected to the U.S. Senate. And so he could not get it. And I looked to see what percentage of the people of Utah made it impossible for the people of Utah to vote for the person they would have sent to the United States Senate. One-tenth of one percent of the population. That's Texas. That's Utah, that's Oklahoma, that's 46 states. So one thing is, you talk about anti-democracy, our party system has made it so that the people, you know, we're talking about the people, democracy rules, the people can't choose between the candidates they want. They can only choose between those that the hardliners in the parties decided to nominate, no matter how few. So that's, part, that's what's happened to the um, uh, democracy part. What about the republic? Um, more and more people in elective office, uh, and, and voters too, want the outcome they want. They want the outcome they want. What, no matter what you have to do, you have to have a nuclear option so you can't pass anything in the United States Senate unless you have 60 votes. Okay, do that. We can win that way. Um, do you want to um, say, we're not going to let this Supreme Court nominee who we oppose, but we're not even going to let him have a hearing? We'll do that. When I was in the House, so, you know, now it's the Republicans doing this to the Democrats. When, when I was in the House, it was the Democrats doing it to us uh, and saying, you know, you're in the minority, we won't let you offer amendments, we won't let you offer bills, we, you know, we'll just shut you out of the process. Uh, and so the idea that we are a republic in which our representatives, I, I know who the president is and who the president before this was, and who the one before that was. And a president is a cool job, I admit it. You get helicopters, you have Easter egg parties. I mean, it's a nice gig. But if we followed the Constitution, the power is in the legislative branch. It's the legislative branch that is supposed to make these decisions. And part of what the legislative branch's job is, is to be a check on the president not to look at the president as the quarterback of your team. The idea that you will support a president 
as the Democrats did with Obama when he found ways to get around needing Senate approval of treaties, and as Republicans now do it, you know, with, with the Republican in the White House, you know, when you start doing that, you destroy the single most important part of the United States Constitution, which is the separation of powers. The separation of powers that creates three separate equal branches. I get asked all the time when I'm on shows, you know, what presidents did you serve under? I never served under any president in my life. I served concurrently with presidents because the power is in the legislative branch. And, and um, mentioning the Congress, I do want to make an exception. I want to point out, as I talk about uh, the current Congress, you know, represent Tom Cole is, to my mind, one of the great Americans alive. Tom, I learned so much from Tom when he was on my staff. He was on my staff, and I was learning from him. And it was, it was, it was cool. And, and you're very lucky to be working for him. Um, but when, what's the things that you can do when you're in offices of responsibility is to understand you do your best to try to get your view to prevail. If you're on the weaker side, you try not to lose as much as you could lose. If you're on the stronger side, you understand you may not, you try to get some of what you want changed. And if you don't succeed, you come back and maybe after the next election you can succeed, or the one after that. Things change. But when you destroy the system, when you trash the courts if the courts don't give a judgment that you like. When you trash the press because they're fake news. What's the definition of fake news? Somebody who reveals fact that you don't want. You know, when, when, when you undercut and attack the very basic institutions of a free society, then, then you're going to lose that free society. You're not going to deserve to live in it. Uh, so that's part of it. So I, I, I want to, and I'm, I'm going to stop and we can do our thing here, but uh, one of the um, concerns I have, I guess I'm, I'm going to partly speak over your heads to the millennials who are here. Uh, I, I've got some numbers that, that are a little bit shocking, and I wrote them down because I, I can't always remember the, the precise numbers. but. Um, the, um, give me a moment, I've got to find this. Um, oh, well, these are recent surveys. This is Pew, Knight, you know, great surveys. Among millennials, among your generation, one in five appro has an approval, approves of Congress. One in five approves of Congress. Half of millennials dislike both political parties. Me too. So, I mean, I'm a millennial, right? Uh, only one in five millennials trust the federal government to do the right thing most of the time. Only one third trust the media. One in four millennials, one in four millennials thinks that free elections are unimportant. One-fourth of millennials think free elections are not important. One-third, one-third think that protecting civil liberties is essential. One-fourth of millennials think democracy is a bad idea. And, you know, I'll just end with this, because I'm putting this as a challenge. Why do they think that? They're not stupid. Why do they think it's a bad idea? Why do they think it doesn't work? Well, think about it. A lot of the uh, democracy rests on a bedrock of institutions, right? It rests on private institutions, public institutions. The, um, 
the corporate world, and I'm, I'm a capitalist through and through. I believe in capitalism. Socialism can never destroy capitalism, but capitalists can destroy capitalism by overreaching. And it has become very common in the corporate world to buy into Milton Friedman's idea that a corporation's main job, only job, is to maximize the profits of its shareholders. How do you do that? Ship the jobs overseas. Put in robots. Leave people unemployed. And you go into these places, and I do it all the time. I'm not a Luddite. I mean, you walk in and you, these places where, um, at a drugstore, they have the machines. It's so quick, you can do this. Or, or, um, uh, and, and what happened to the employees who were there? Well, they're, they're somewhere. We don't know where they are. Uh, you go into a bank, and it is automated, and the tellers are gone. And those are real people. Those are real people trying to support their families. But corporations have gotten in, and you have, I believe, being a capitalist, that the people who come up with the ideas, who create the products, create the services, ought to make more money than the people who are on the assembly line, but not thousands of times more money. I have never known, I grew up poor, and I've never known a poor person who hated other people for having money, if they got it fairly. So the problem is not the inequality, but the problem is whether or not the people who have less have enough. And when you have a large portion of our society where people can't be confident that they can pay their medical bill or they can get their car repaired if it's fixed or that they can you know, have a house or that their children are going to have a house, then we have a problem here with how capitalists are treating capitalism. If you have, you know, the, 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 um, our founding documents put the pursuit of justice up here. Uh, pursuit of justice, that's what we're about. You know, I have enormous respect for people who put their lives on the line, people wearing blue, the, our law enforcement people, uh, who are like every profession. So 99.999% of people in law enforcement are, are wonderful, great, smart, caring people. But when you have unarmed people getting killed the way they are now, there's something wrong. So we, we have some problems in the society that we're allowing to fester. And I, I, Jerry, I'd already warned you about this last night, because your school is different. This school is, is great and different. But most colleges and universities today focus primarily only on teaching you to get a job. Well, I'm glad they do that. They, they teach you how to have a skill. They teach you how to learn what you need to learn in order to make a living. Well, I have a law degree and a, and a journalism degree, and that's what I learned. But schools also have the responsibility to teach you to be citizens. And you do that not by mastering a skill, but by reading literature, reading poetry, listening to music, li you know, uh, the humanities, philosophy, history, art. That makes you a caring, empathetic human being. And those are getting washed out because there's not enough money, because we don't spend money on education. If you don't spend money on education, you should not be spending money on anything, because it's the most important. <laughs> So anyway, I, I could just go through all of the professions, all of the ways in which we are, the society is letting us down. And if you're a millennial and that's the society, the only one you know, you know, I guess it's understandable that you would have some concerns. So anyway, so I've unloaded here. I love this country. When I was a kid growing up in Capitol Hill, uh, I mean, I was reading all the time about uh, Nathan Hale and Ethan Allen and Francis Marion and George Washington and, you know, all the great people who created this country. And, and I love what it is. I love the Constitution. I spent all my time thinking and talking about the Constitution. And I am not going to go down without a fight. I'm not going to let people destroy what this wonderful nation is because we have turned into a group of people, not you, but so many out there 
who, are, who demonize the press, demonize people who disagree with them, demonize the courts. Um, you know, we have responsibilities to be better than that, not to be our lowest, basest people. Uh, you know, um, what, what does the Lord require of thee? To do, to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with thy God. Do justice, love mercy. You know, where did that go? Where did that go? That's what we have to recapture. So, anyway, thank you for listening to me. Mickey, thank, thank you for those inspiring words, and I assure you this college is different. I know. And as evidence of the fact that, yes, we train people for jobs, but we also train them to be good citizens, is this event today. Well, I just... Oh. Demolish that whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps there's someone in the audience here today that's thinking of running for public office. Yeah. What advice would you give them? Well, I, first of all, I would say yes, I, and, and probably like you, I, I find it hard to imagine not wanting to run for public office because the, the whole thing about our system is that we make the decisions. We pick people from among ourselves to make those choices and then to run for office. So number one, I, I do encourage anybody, anybody to run for office. Uh, secondly, how do you do it? Well, you know, I was poor. I didn't know anybody who had money. I, I actually had people on my staff threaten to quit the staff if I wouldn't go out and ask for money because I was terrified. You know, to me, asking uh, for somebody for $100 was an imposition you couldn't even imagine because, you know, uh, that was such a huge amount of money. You'd never um, make it as a college president. No, I'll bet. <laughs> I, I was aware of that. Uh, so... Um, Part of it is you, you have to prepare and go out. So uh, I ran against John Jarman, and uh, he'd been there for 24 years, and everybody said I could not beat him, and they were right. But I got, I got almost 49%, and, and so I won the next time. But in the, in the interim, I went out and I said, I, I've got to know more people. Uh, now, how do you get to know more people? Uh, I worked for the Muscular Dystrophy Association doing volunteer work. We were losing the Oklahoma City Symphony and we had a group called the Save Our Symphony and I, I did volunteer work for them. So I did two things. I was doing good for the community and I was also building relationships so that uh, because you don't... I used to joke when, when I was um, giving a talk and I would say, wow, you know, I don't know how I won. I mean, I didn't didn't know anybody, you know, I didn't know how I won, my campaign manager didn't know how I won, the people on my staff didn't know how I won, my mother didn't know how I won, but I did. Well, but, I, but, it's, but it's a joke, I know how I won. I won because of Jack and Rick and pe people who helped me do that, who were out there uh, getting the volunteers. And, and you have to go out and find people who share your views, share your visions, and, and you know, organize, recruit them. Those of you who are in this school now who are students, and um, if you run for office, as I hope you will, and you fail to send a note or make a phone call to every single person who was in your classes asking them to help, you know, you're doing it wrong. Um, and so this is what you did, right? You, you built the relationships. Yeah. Mickey, what, what lessons uh, from your time in public office uh, what lessons did we learn that we could apply to the current political situation? Well, uh, I, I, I mentioned to you before that um, I went out to speak at Southwestern State because they were doing a thing for Congressman Glenn English, a Democrat, a good friend of mine. Um, and what I learned when, when I was there that, that we can all apply is that if you actually know people as human beings, you get past the labels on their foreheads. You, you know them as a human being. You spend time with them. You really get a whole different picture of, of them. And uh, we used to hang out together. We would... Uh, one terrible story that I won't tell, but yes, it is. Glenn and I were once playing golf together while the legislature was redistricting. <laughs> we were, we were 
calling back home saying, spare us, spare us. You know, we're do, doing it together. Um, so, you know, part of it is, so John is a part, John Eccles is part of this program I run for um, the best rising young political stars in America. Uh, last night, Ken Miller uh, was uh, having dinner with us, and, and uh, another one, and there's a whole bunch of the people in, in Oklahoma government who are part of it. Over 300 people, completely bipartisan, uh, from all over the country. Uh, and the way we have our, start our program, it's a program where uh, I put them through over a period of uh, two years, uh, four times we come together for four, uh, three times, for four days at a time to talk about Plato and Confucius and Aristotle and Locke and Hobbes and all this stuff uh, and, uh, and have completely open, candid conversations with each other about values and principles. And the key is, on the opening night, when nobody knows each other, I have them a dinner that probably lasts five hours. Uh, John had to go through this and say, you get up there and you tell us about yourself. Don't give a campaign speech. We've all given campaign speeches. Tell us who you are, what made you the way you are. And, and we have had over the years, we've listened as people you would never believe it. Who, I mean, it's all very, you know, we, we keep it private. People who hold very high offices. Three were in Obama's cabinet. We've got 13 in Congress, a couple in the Senate. Uh, Two of them are running for governor against each other in California right now. I mean, we've got five governors uh, uh, who have come through the program. And on that opening night, they just tell, you be amazed how many grew up in trailer homes. Be amazed how many didn't have food. Or you knew, uh, we, we had one, um, uh, a state senator from out west, uh, African-American Democrat, uh, who kind of broke down in the middle of it and said, you know, everybody calls me senator. My, my, my grandfather said to me, you know, they call you senator. They called me boy. And, you know, we, um, we get to know each other as human beings. And when you do that, all this little frippery nonsense about which club you belong to really disappears pretty quickly. Uh, and so that's the main thing we have to do, just get to know each other as human beings. Who are the people who are the major influences in your life and or your political career? Well, in my political career, one was Tom, even though I'd already won. He, he really made a difference uh, in helping me think things through. Um, one of my high school teachers, Billy Davison at uh, Capitol Hill High School, uh, uh, was my first journalism teacher and uh, uh, made a difference in my life. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to start skipping ahead and say, my parents, my, my parents, you know, um, my parents were very different from each other in their personalities, but uh, I always felt loved, always, you know, and I knew they loved me and, and I knew they loved my sister, uh, and they were very supportive. My dad actually taught me to be a writer. Neither of my parents had ever gone to college. Um, they, um, they, their families were immigrants from Poland and Lithuania. Uh, we were the only Jewish kids on the south side of, of Oklahoma City. Uh, and they, my dad read, you know, dime novels. He read detective stories and, you know, uh, sports stories and all that stuff. And he said, forget all that. I, I still cannot, I, God, I can't say this to you. You're a college president. Uh, I mean, I still can't diagram a sentence. But, but, I, but I know what sounds right. <laughs> and so, you know, so uh, I, I learned uh, to write that way. Um, and in Congress, there was a guy named Jack Kemp, who, uh, a Republican congressman who argued all the time, we need to be inclusive. So, uh, uh, and, and we need to create opportunity. That's what our conservatives were about, creating opportunity. And uh, one of the people I learned a lot from uh, was, wish he were here, Russell Perry, the uh, editor of uh, uh, the Black Chronicle. And so, uh, it just, uh, I, I've learned a lot from everybody. I started out knowing nothing. I still know very little, but, but I, I've, you know, stolen from a lot of people. Yeah. 
Would, would you uh, reflect with us about uh, the 2016 presidential campaign, uh, the election of President Trump, and the, uh, the current Trump administration? Something sure not to be controversial. <laughs> well, you know, um, I, I have a lot of close friends here who um, voted for Donald Trump and supported him. And uh, um, I was mentioning before about the problems uh, in the country, um, jobs being shipped overseas, um, you know, so many things that, that, are, that have not been going right. Uh, and so people who voted for Donald Trump, I understand why they voted for him. Uh, I could not do it. Uh, and it, it just, to me, the character of a person matters a lot. And I could not overlook um, his character. Uh, a guy's good friends who said, you know, yeah, but he's going he's to get tax cuts. Eventually, you're going to get tax cuts. I believe in tax cuts. You know, but how big a price are you going to pay for the tax cuts? How big a price are you going to do with, you know, risking the possibility of a nuclear war? How, how much are you willing to put up with uh, destroying our alliances? Uh, how much are you willing to put up with uh, a new tariff war that will, you know, drive up the, the cost of everything and, and hurt everybody in this room? How much are you willing to put up with the demonizing of reporters who write stories that may be true but you don't like and so you, you know, how m So the question is, we all know the policies we would like to see in place and we have to ask ourselves, how much are we willing to put up with? How much risk to what we are as a country are we willing to put up with uh, in order to get those benefits? Uh, people, I, I had people I cared a lot about would say, well, we can't have Hillary because she'll put X on the Supreme Court. And I said, well, how does she do that? In the same way Obama put Merrick Garland on the Supreme Court, presidents don't put anybody on Supreme Courts. You know, they, they suggest, and the Senate says yes or no. You know, so she wasn't going to put anybody on the Supreme Court. Republican Senate, they weren't going to put anybody on the Supreme Court. And she nominated, it was ridiculous. Uh, and so I, I was an active member and still am of Never Trump. Um, and I understand there's a lot of policies that he has supported that I say, okay, you know, good. I like that policy. But um, there are some steps I'm not willing to take that are undermining... Um, we're not just a democracy. We're a liberal democracy, meaning a democracy with rule of law, a democracy with uh, uh, justice, a, a democracy uh, that has all these basic individual rights protected. And I'm not willing to throw away our Constitution uh, and our system in order to get a tax cut. Just not. Uh, and, and I will say... You know, I, I love Tom Cole, so I'm addressing this to other members of Congress. Um, with our primary system that I talked about, members of Congress are rational people. They're, they know what will get them defeated. They try to avoid doing what will get them defeated. But you know what? I got defeated. And I got defeated, so I got to teach at Harvard. I got defeated, I got to teach at Princeton. I got defeated, uh, and I, I got to uh, write books, and I got to do, uh, do all kinds of things, and I got to be here. You know, losing an election is not the end of looking. You lost an election, look at you. I mean, you know, so if you, it would be good to have people in our political offices who have the courage to do what they're required to do. And one of the things is the separation of power. If you're in Congress, your job is to serve as a check on the president. That is the job of Congress. It is not your job to be a supporter of the president because he belongs to your club. And uh, I, that's, you know, I, I learned that. When I, was in, was not, when I was in Congress, Republicans and Democrats alike stood up to presidents who went over the line. I don't know if you all remember, you all so damn young, but, um, <laughs> but when Richard Nixon was forced to, to quit, to resign, it was Republican senators who went to him, Barry Goldwater among them, who said, you're out of here. Uh, I, I would give anything to see that kind of courage in Congress today. Thank you. 
perhaps we have time for a, uh, one more question. Uh, during your time as a congressman, several significant events occurred on the world stage, including the elevation of Saddam Hussein as president of Iraq. Mar Margaret Thatcher became the first woman prime minister in Britain. Ronald Reagan was elected president. He nominated Sandra Day O'Connor as the first woman Supreme Court justice, the Challenger explosion, the Persian Gulf War, and on and on and on. Yeah. Are there one or two of those events that changed U.S. politics permanently, and if so, what, what were they? Well, there were some that uh, I don't know about permanently, but uh, so when Ronald Reagan ran for president in 1980, um, I, I stayed out at first because, uh, uh, so I'm going to say something that, that is aimed at Reagan, so I want to say this first. Um, a friend, another friend of mine was running, and so I said, okay, I was for Reagan, but I stayed out of it. When Reagan lost to H.W. Bush in the Iowa caucuses, I called Reagan at, at home in California and told him, okay, you know, I'm in. Uh, and I became the chairman of all of his policy task forces. Uh, and I was very close to Reagan. He came down here several times, you know, to help me in my campaigns. Uh, uh, I flew with him on Air Force One, flew over Bartlesville in order to, well, after they'd had a tornado. And I mean, I, I, I admired him greatly. Uh, a wonderful, great man. Um, but he had people around him, I still like to believe he didn't know, uh, people around him uh, like Oliver North and others who uh, in Iran-Contra, you know, violated the law. They, they violated the law. Uh, and uh, uh, I understood, you know, that that was one of the things, Iran-Contra was one of the things that helped create a sense of uh, suspicion about government. And I, that was one of them. Uh, and it was a terrible thing. I, I mean, I supported the Contras. Uh, when when uh, Congress cut off funding for the Contras, uh, I went down there, I met with them, I, I, had, uh, I introduced an amendment that overturned the ban, provided $100 million for the country, so I believed in it. But I also supported the government in El Salvador uh, at the same time, supported the rebels in, in Nicaragua and the government in El Salvador. Um, and our State Department lied to us. I, I found out, you know, that uh, we, should not, I, we should have been supporting Nicaragua, no matter what liberals think. Uh, supporting the Contras in Nicaragua. But we should not have been supporting the government in El Salvador. They were responsible for atrocities that our State Department was blaming uh, on other people. So, yeah, I, I, I learned a lot, and, and the American people learned a lot, that your government will lie to you. Uh, and it has sort of now become expected. And uh, that's something that uh, I think, you know, made a big difference permanently. Uh, it wasn't just Vietnam. There were a lot of things that made people say, what are we doing? And we haven't really learned a lesson. I mean, we went into Vietnam, uh, which was a mistake. You know, why did we go into Iraq? Saddam Hussein found out about, you know, the bombing on 9-11 the same way we did. He read about it in the paper. I mean, he had nothing to do with it. Um, and so uh, I, I think that we, we have become more... Uh, able to look at and say, you, you got to keep the, the free press and everything with an eye on the president and on the administration because you can't just take the press release for granted, for, you know, truth. Okay, thank you. Let's, uh, let's thank uh, Congressman Mickey Edwards one more time. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. That's great. Thanks. Thanks for letting me be home. <laughs>